Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 28 of my beta campaign. I know I haven't spent much time in these episodes in the vehicle assembly building, but I want to show you something that's a feature of Kerbal Construction Time, and that is the ability to do simulations in orbit around other bodies. So what I'm doing here is I'm selecting the moon as my body to orbit. I select an altitude for my orbit, and then I want to increase the time of this simulation from the default 15 minutes up to an hour, because I figure oh, I'll give myself an hour to see if I can land this thing. And what this thing is, is a very simple little lander with the idea of picking up a surface temperature scan mission. But what I want to do is I want to test the ability of this thing to land in a very specific location. Now I will talk a little more about this lander when it comes up for real. Again, this is just a simulation mode and this will come up for real probably in the next episode. Um, but I just wanted to show you how this simulation works, how you can test run this thing and uh, see how it all kind of goes. Um, you know, in this simulation mode so that when you go to do it for real, you know a little bit more about what to expect as far as how the particular vessel will behave. Now, there is one um, limitation, and I think a good limitation, that's built into Kerbal Construction Time, and that is if you're playing in career mode, you don't get the ability to do a simulation around a body until you have put a vessel into the sphere of influence of that body at some point in your career. So because I have quite a lot of objects that have gone into the sphere of influence of the moon, I have the moon as a potential place I can run a simulation from. I have Minmus because I have put a satellite around Minmus by this point in my career, but I don't have any other bodies. So that's great. But anyway, um, this ended up working out pretty well. I ended up putting this thing right down on the money, but I think it's time to leave this one and show you something else that, you, that I did in simulation mode. And this is a nuclear uh, plane. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So <laughs> this is obviously my first go at this, and I got to uh, move those landing gear uh, back a little bit. But uh, this is simulation mode, so we'll we'll see if we can do this anyway. So we're gonna we're gonna throttle this thing up and see if we can still not get it off the runway. That's the joy of a simulation mode: is that once you paid for the simulation, anything else is not going to cost you anything. So we'll throttle up, and hopefully we'll get this plane sort of uh, get down and level. There it goes. Getting down there, all the wheels now are on the runway, and pitching up. Ooh, this thing really doesn't want to go up. That's something else to look at. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so what this thing is, is a nuclear-powered jet. Yeah, I got into going nuclear in the last episode, so I thought I'd play around a little bit more with this. So this has a uh, thermonuclear jet engine, turbojet engine on the back of it. And if you take a look at the fuselage, there's only a handful of parts there, and none of those parts are liquid fuel tanks. This doesn't have any liquid fuel on it. The only thing powering it is the uranium nitride that is in the nuclear uh, generator there. So let's take a look at that. And you can see here that it's got enough fuel to run for two, about 224 days. So that means this thing could fly straight for 224 days. Uh-oh. Oh, I think, I think instead of closing the window, I think I just shut down the reactor. Uh, yep, I can see that heat plummeting. Okay, that's not good. <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, again, simulation mode. Remember simulation mode? Uh, yeah, I can't restart this reactor from the outside. I believe the reactors can only be restarted through an EVA. Well, Jeb, what do you think? Do you think you can get back there? Let's, uh, let's throttle this right off and let it slow down and see if we can not get Jeb back there to try and turn this nuclear reactor back on and get this thing powering once again. Okay, here we go. Alright, we'll go down and we'll let go. And, oh, this is not looking good already. Come on, Jeb. You can do it, Jeb. No, Jeb can't do it. Okay, simulation mode. You know, kind of in hindsight, maybe landing it and then going in AVA might have been a better idea. But, oh well, we'll give this another go. So this is uh, the second iteration of, of this particular plane, and I've, I've changed a couple of things. Number one is I moved those rear landing legs back so it now sits on the runway properly. And what I've also done is I put a pair of canards up at the front to help with uh, pitching. And so this thing should be able to lift off the runway uh, quite a bit easier than before. So we'll throttle up. I do like the uh, animation on the engine as you throttle up. Oh, and this takes off actually very, very easily. Look at that. Oh, that's beautiful. 
All right, so let's see how this thing behaves. Um, seems to be actually pretty good. I rather like this. Okay, and it has actually a respectable amount of thrust. So the one thing you got to do, if you're going to build yourself a nuclear jet, and these are all built out of, by the way, most of these parts are B-9 aerospace parts, in case you are interested. Or they're not, I'm sorry, they're the interstellar parts that are the parts that are, that are powering this thing. Look at that, we can do a nice little climb. Lots of thrust. Very nice. Okay, so let's talk about what this is powering with. So we got what we got is a nuclear reactor there at the back, and then right at the back there is a thermonuclear turbojet engine. Uh, and you have to connect that straight to the nuclear generator for it to work. Ahead of the nuclear generator is a radiator for radiating away all the excess heat that this generator is generating. And notice it's a little different than the deployable radiators that I've been using in space. This radiator is designed to work in an atmosphere, and so um, it looks a little bit more like what you would see like in a car radiator, in a, in a radiator in your car, right? It works a little bit more on, on that idea. And at the front of it, what I have is an air scoop. And what's going on here is it's is the, the air, the circular air intake at the front is bringing in the atmosphere. That atmosphere is being heated up by in the nuclear reactor and then being projected out the back and that is what's causing the thrust. So um, that ends up producing a pretty efficient plane. It, it, it's not using up any kind of liquid fuel at all. Like I mentioned before, this thing can run for almost 224 days straight. Uh, and that, that sounds pretty awesome, though I don't see any practical value in KSP for that. And what I'm interested in right now is seeing just how high this thing can climb. Um, you know, what's its effective cruising altitude? And this is real technology, by the way. Uh, these types of propulsion were, were experimented with um, in the 1960s, uh, and, then, and then ultimately abandoned, I would suspect, because if one of these things ever crashed, obviously the, the potential mess it might create would be rather catastrophic. Um, but this here in KSP, this seems to be working pretty good. I'm up to seven. 17 kilometers. I am seeing that my thrust is really dying off. That's what's going to happen with, with this type of engine as opposed to the normal stock turbojet engines is with the stock turbojet engines, when they don't get enough air, they're just going to cut off. What's happening here is this engine will continue to run, but without enough air going into it, what you're going to get is the thrust is going to drop off. So my thrust is now down to about 12 kilonewtons. So I'm down around kind of the effective range of of uh, you know, it's it's I, I really can't get much higher than that. And I want to I'm up about 20 kilometers, so that's pretty good. Uh, I've got my speed up to about 430 climbing up. I can probably get it overall. Definitely get it over 450 meters per second. That's all right. But you know, in reality, um, that's really not all that much better. <laughs> that's actually about the same as what I got out of the Aristarchus, which is my stock uh, jet plane for getting around and doing these on Kerbin type of missions. So it really doesn't provide, as of now, any particular advantages over that particular plane, but it sure is kind of cool. So what I'll do is I'll keep playing with this idea, see if I can put together something that's uh, both neat and practical for finishing off uh, aerial contracts within Kerbin's atmosphere. But why don't we talk a bit about what's coming up in this particular episode. This episode is going to be about attempting to set up that moon base. So we have a lab module, which is a necessary component of that moon base contract, and that's going to be on its way to the moon. And then we're going to send up a couple of Kerbals to uh, set up our permanent presence on the lunar surface. So what we have here is the Kanata Moon Base Lab Module. And the first thing you might be noticing is that the nav ball is kind of on its side. And that's because I do have a probe core in there that is uh, not oriented the right way right now. But that will make sense later. Um, but I, I have another probe, mo uh, another probe body in here that should be oriented vertically with the nav ball right now. If I can just find it. Well, at least I think it should be in here. Well, after some further searching and confirmation in the vehicle assembly building, it turned out that I had forgotten to put in that second probe body. And so I was left with two decisions. Number one was to attempt to fly it this way. But, and number two was to scrub this mission. And what I decided to do was to scrub, well, not the mission, but the launch. To scrub this launch because then I would get 100% of my funds back. 
And yes, it would take some time to roll out another vessel and to re rebuild this thing, but I think that was time well spent rather than risking losing this mission altogether. And while we're waiting for all that to get sorted out, we move on to the Samayaji. So the Samayaji uh, has itself a little mission just to test the rapier engine. So this is a pretty simple one. Um, no payload other than that, so I, uh, all that's in the cargo bay is a single rapier engine. So the whole mission is just simply to get into low carbon orbit, get to the appropriate altitude for the contract, stage to test the engine, and then get this thing back down. Now the rapier engine is something that I haven't uh, unlocked yet. And for those that may not know, the rapier engine is a stock engine which can be switched from being an air-breathing engine like a jet engine and then switch to a rocket mode where it's burning liquid fuel and oxidizer. So this makes it very, very good, a very, very good engine for single staged orbits, especially for space planes. It makes it an excellent engine for that, but I haven't unlocked it yet. This is just a test part. Um, and the reason why I haven't unlocked it yet is because I'm still about $2 million short of being able to upgrade my research and development center, which will allow me to uh, go to the next level on the tech tree, but yeah, I don't know. There's still a lot of tech that I've yet to explore, so I still think there's still some interesting things coming up. And I'm hoping that one of the things that you will find interesting is this particular vessel. This is the Tycho, and the Tycho is a manned, my second manned lunar lander. Um, and actually, I got a few things in here that are a little bit different that I want to show you that I'm playing with, and one of those things are the smart parts. I started using smart parts a couple of uh, episodes ago with the Samiyaji and so I thought I'd start using them a little bit more. So what I have here is I have a smart port detecting fuel and when the solid fuel is done in that booster it's going to stage which will eject the boosters. And then I got a couple of other parts here. I got this timer part on the right and that timer will go off a half a second after the boosters separate, which will engage the main engine, and then beside that is an altitude detector, which when it gets to, I think it's around 53 or 54 kilometers, will stage again, which will um, open up the fairings. So, uh, the idea here is that this will work in conjunction with KOS, and, and I think the smart parts in KOS actually make a very uh, powerful combination, because you can use KOS to do sort of this uh, stock uh, ascent profile. So the KOS program that I'm starting here really for the most part only points the vessel in the right direction. And then the smart parts are used to stage at the appropriate times. And what's nice about that is you can keep the ascent profile exactly the same all the time. So you never have to modify that KOS program. But then you just use the appropriate speed. You adapt the smart parts for each particular vessel. And of course those parts stay with the vessels. So you can see that in the Tycho we have uh, our pilot Tom Clock and our engineer Genimal and they're going to be our fourth and fifth people to walk on the surface of the moon if all things go well and they're going to be setting up the base so that's why I didn't send a scientist up, I sent an engineer up because I figured oh well no an engineer is going to be necessary to be firing up the nuclear reactor and connecting things together. And the other thing as well is I'm not really interested in collecting science. So in fact, this particular vessel has no science equipment on it whatsoever. Another new feature of this particular vessel are the fairings. These are the largest fairings I've used so far. These are 3.75 meter fairings. And as you can see here, as they deploy, they come out um, in three pieces and they just look great when they separate like this, don't they? Um, Tycho, yeah, Tycho is named after Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe is a 16th century Danish scientist and astronomer. Um, really what he is the most known for is the meticulous observations he made. He was uh, the quintessential data collector. He, he, took, he took copious amounts of data on the, on the motions of planets and, and, and objects within the solar system. And in fact, it was his data that his student, Johannes Kepler, used when he finally uh, realized that circles were not the way to go when it came to putting together a model of the solar system, but instead went with ellipses. And Tycho is also, you might have heard the name before, because Tycho is an actual rather prominent crater in the southern hemisphere of our own moon. So, uh, yeah, he's honored with that particular naming. 
You know, looking at this, this might be one of the ugliest and most utilitarian vessels I've ever built, and I rather like it. <laughs> you can see that I'm taking advantage of those B9 landing legs once again. These are the same ones that are on the Samayaji, and you can see how uh, you can attach things to them radially other than the landing legs. I also have landing lights attached there to the side and some RCS thruster blocks there. So the, they're pretty handy. They're pretty neat to use. On the top, I have uh, the two-person landing cam, and then, uh, you know, really just a little bit of fuel and some other junk antennas and stuff attached to it, and that's about the end of it. Now, at this point, I completed my transfer burn to the moon and on my way out there. And if you take a look, you'll see that I only have 943 meters per second of delta V left. And for those that know kind of the, few, the uh, delta V requirements for landing on the moon, you'll probably recognize that this is pretty sketchy for getting in orbit and landing on the moon. It's going to be very, very tight for fuel, let alone getting these people off again and getting them back to Kerbin. Well, a couple of things to take note of. Number one, my target right now is not going to be the surface of the moon. My target is the Kanata space station that's in orbit around the moon. Um, that's because that particular space station has quite a bit of fuel left on it. So what I want to do is I want to land on that or dock with that station and uh, we'll steal some of its fuel. And that will allow me to comfortably land on the moon and get back off again. Even with that though, I have no plans whatsoever to ever have this thing uh, the, the Tycho return back to Kerbin. Uh, this does not have the ability to enter back into Kerbin's atmosphere and do a landing. Instead, it's going to remain in the moon's sphere of influence and just act as a lander probably forever from now on going from the lunar surface just to the Kanata station that's in orbit around the moon. And then what the plan is going to be is to start to build um, Kind of a transit system, right? A Kerbin system transit system. My next step would be to build a support ship that would be capable of going from low Kerbin orbit to the moon or to Minmus. So when it comes time to get Tom Plock and Gentleman back home, they're going to require a support vessel in order to do that. And also by that time, I hope to have um, a space plane that was capable of ferrying crew from Kerbin surface up to low Kerbin orbit. And I really like doing that. I really like when I start to get to this stage of the game to start to think about building this sort of permanent transportation system uh, within the Kerbin system rather than launching these large kind of Apollo style missions always from Kerbin system and or from Kerbin surface. It ends up being a much more efficient use of the funds and the resources that you have available in the game. And as I close on in on the Kanata station, uh, I almost forgot the fact that there are radiator panels that are sticking out uh, perpendicular to the station, so there's a little bit of emergency RCS trying to avoid hitting those, but uh, no, no harm done. Everything came out okay. And normally I'm a little bit annoyed when uh, I end up having to do these things in the dark, because obviously when I uh, record things in the dark, it's not the best thing for you folks to be viewing, but here I get to show something off because I have this uh, groovy dooey little spotlight here that I can open up with this nice little animation, and, and I've completely forgotten, by the way, which mod this thing is associated with, so if any of you happen to know what mod this, this spotlight comes from, uh, that would be great. You can let me know, but it is pretty cool because what you can do, what it'll do is it will automatically point itself at what you have targeted and lock itself on there as uh, no matter how you maneuver the vessel around, it'll do its best to keep itself locked on the target. So I can line up or light up the station and... Um, and then I thought, you know, now that I got the station all lit up nice and uh, I, got, I have an external camera hooked up just beside the docking port, why don't I do this whole docking from the internal view here. And after docking is complete, it's time to transfer over some fuel so that we can land this thing on the moon and still have enough fuel left over to get back up to this station uh, when we need to. Uh, I do want to leave a little bit of fuel in that transfer stage that's attached to the space station because I do want to leave enough to be able to deorbit it. But it was after transferring over the fuel when I suddenly realized something that I'm going to land these guys on the moon and yes there is a base down there that has plenty of food and plenty of life support and all the rest of it but all the parts for attaching the space station together are uh, including attaching on the nuclear generator to provide the electricity to survive the night, are on the 
lab module, which remember was the mission that I scrubbed and is still coming here. So I suddenly realized, I'm glad I realized it now before I actually land these guys, that if I land these guys right now, they might have some issues when it comes to electricity uh, if I can't get the lab module up there uh, in enough time. So I decided I was going to leave these guys on the station, so I transferred them over to the station and, whoa, what, Genimo, come on, what, really? Oh, Tom Plock, you too? I mean, really, guys, what's up with this? I mean, everything's going fine. You guys really need to grow a backbone. This is, this is, this is, I would think you guys would like it here. Anyway, uh, I thought while we were going around and waiting for the uh, lab module to finish building and get rolled out on the runway that we can collect some EVA science over some biomes that I missed in the past. And otherwise, though, it's just time to ride around the moon until the uh, lab module is ready to get on up here. And speaking of which, here it is, now refitted with a second probe body to fix the issue that caused the first attempt to launch this thing to be scrubbed. This is the lab module. Uh, just like the habitat module of the base, it's going up uh, unmanned. Uh, the idea being that we will launch this and then we will set down Tom Clark and Genimal who will do the final hooking together and finally get this base uh, up and operational and get ourselves a permanent presence on the lunar surface. And actually quite a number of contracts are going to be finished off when that is done because I have the finished, you know, the lunar base or the lunar base contract. I also have a send some science back from the surface of the moon contract. There is a plant a flag on the moon contract. So this will uh, clean off a lot of things out of my uh, to-do list, so to speak. And once again, I'm using those smart parts in conjunction with KOS. I really do like the way that those two mods kind of work together. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but they do uh, do work together very, very well. And by the way, with the KOS and my launch program, I used to have it that it uh, did the whole thing. I, I like actually having these, just setting these launches and having them go and not having to touch the keyboard. I, I don't I don't know why. This is such a routine thing doing launches. It's nice to have these things go off automatically and that's somewhat satisfying as well. Um, I used to have it that it actually did the whole thing and put the thing into low curve and orbit, but I always, I, I'm so particular about my orbits and I always found I could never get it to do as nice a circularization as I could manually. So that's why I have the program actually end um, once my apoapsis is reached and the fairing is, uh, is separated off. So here you can get a little bit of a look at the thing. It's got the mobile processing lab on the top and the bottom. It's got that transfer stage to get it to the moon and also to do a good part of the descent burn. Uh, once I'm in descent and that fuel in the transfer stage is gone, it will be separated and will be crashing into the lunar surface while the mobile processing lab with a little bit of fuel and some landing legs and some and its own little rockets will be able to land on the moon. You can see that it's got um, an antenna sticking out there at the bottom and actually uh, that antenna is attached to um, a, a second probe body and that was that second probe body that gave that weird nav ball problem that I was having with my first attempt at launching this thing but it's important for me to have that uh, pro body on there that way because this thing is going to land with the lab module horizontal and so after I separate the uh, transfer stage I'm going to have to switch control to that uh, pro body which will get the orientation to work the way I need it to go once I land it. You'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when I land this thing. Um, I did however run into a little bit of an issue and the issue didn't become apparent until after I completed my lunar insertion and got my low lunar orbit and then I happened to take a look over there at Kerbal Engineer. Thankfully I did take a look at it and noticed that I only have 580 meters per second of delta V left and that is really tight. I mean someone who's really efficient at landing that that would be an efficient landing um, but I not only just want to do a decent landing, I want to land it in a particular location and I also want to have some fuel to be able to move it around and get it into the spot at the base where I want it to be. I don't think I'll be able to put this thing on the surface for that much. In fact, I think the likely outcome, if I didn't notice that that, if I didn't look over at Kerbal Engineer and went and did my descent, the likely outcome would have been I would have ran out of fuel on the way down and this thing would have just crashed into the lunar surface. So it's a good thing I noticed it at this point where it's just safely in lunar orbit. But that doesn't change the fact is, Somehow I got to get more fuel into this thing. 
I mean, one thing I could do is I could launch another vehicle from uh, Kerbin's orbit just to transfer some fuel up here, but I don't know. I don't want to do that. That's going to cost me quite a bit of money to do that. I would love to get this thing down onto the lunar surface and get Tom Plocked and Genimal down. Remember, they're still in orbit in the uh, Canadas station in orbit around the moon as well. I got to get all that stuff down. I don't want to launch another vessel. I got to somehow think of my options. And I got a few different options that I'm thinking about, but I think they're going to have to wait for the next episode. Sorry about that, but this episode is getting kind of long and getting towards the end. So next episode, we'll try and see if we can get all of this stuff down to the lunar surface and see if we can finally get this base set up. I hope to see you then.